we would like to welcome to our eighth annual In My Mind conference, uh, New York State Commissioner of Health, Dr. Mary Bassett. Um, has an extensive resume and bio. Um, we could probably have a whole conference to discuss, you know, and to talk about her resume and her bio and, and so forth. I mean, all of her many accomplishments. Um, Commissioner Bassett, welcome to In My Mind. This is a really, truly honor for us to have you join us. And thank you. Um, over to you. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate the uh, being spared listening to how lengthy my engagement with public health has been. Um, and I really appreciated the opening, opening um, music. I, uh, one of the things that doesn't appear on my resume is that I have a daughter who uh, attended the University of the West Indies in Kingston. Uh, so I had the pleasure of visiting her uh, several times while she was there. I, I'd like to also uh, acknowledge Joanne Morn, um, who, who told me I ought to show up today uh, and, <laughs> um, and talk with all of you. Um, it's a real pleasure to join you in the in my mind conference and to have a chance to address the issues that face older LGBTQ uh, plus uh, adults in, in our state. Um, you know, one of the goals of um, my whole working life has been to address disparities in um, access to healthcare and health outcomes. Uh, that occur among populations. Um, and in our country, importantly, these have been populations defined by race, ethnicity, um, which uh, often has a very strong correlation to income. Uh, so these are communities that have been traditionally underserved, um, neglected, that includes rural communities actually, as well as our urban communities. And these populations even are often invisible. Um, uh, you know, I use the word invisible advisedly, although every time I use it, I think of the wonderful book uh, by Ralph Ellison, The Invisible Man. But people who feel that they have to hide who they are, they need to hide their sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression, um, because they fear that they will face discrimination if they don't at either a healthcare facility or a nursing facility. That's a form of enforcing invisibility. And the data shows that this happens, that some older LGBTQ people are less likely to go to the doctor because they fear discrimination. Um, they or they have even experienced discrimination. A survey done by SAGE, which is the nation's oldest nonprofit dedicated to improving the lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender older adults, 40% uh, of, um, of respondents in their 60s and 70s reported that their health care provider didn't know about their sexual orientation. Uh, reminds me of a campaign that we uh, ran in New York City, uh, in which we said, if you can't talk to your doctor about your life, you really need to get another doctor. Uh, but that is not always very possible. And the result is that LGBTQ older adults may not receive the comprehensive sexual health care that they need and deserve because of age-related misconceptions and biases. So this um, is the result of providers not asking and patients not telling about their sexual history. Uh, the Lat Latinx population, older people, uh, are the ones that express the most anxiety about the quality of health care that they would receive if they disclose their sexual orientation. I'm just gonna take a moment to close down my um, incoming on my computer so I don't get pinged while speaking with you. Uh, so uh, more than a third of uh, Hispanic respondents said that they hid their sexual orientation from a healthcare provider 
compared to just uh, under a quarter of African Americans and only 16% of white respondents. Uh, th this is really a choice that people make uh, because they're seeking to guarantee the quality of their care. Um, and uh, it's not a choice that people should be forced to make. We have a million New Yorkers in our state who identify as LGBTQ gender nonconforming, and often um, uh, and, and <clears throat> often they face many other barriers in terms of services and supports um, related to marginalizations occurring along many different dimensions. Uh, nearly a quarter of LGBTQ New Yorkers of all ages say that they don't have adequate health insurance and that this is the most significant barrier that they face in terms of accessing health care. And a third over the age of 50 uh, um, live at or below 200% uh, of the federal poverty level um, compared to a, a quarter of uh, people who, who don't identify as LGBTQ. Uh, you know, the, and, you know, our poverty line is utterly um, uh, inadequate. Um, that's why we do things like talk about 200% of poverty, but that still, um, you know, identifies people uh, who are quite lo low income and people at higher income levels still struggle uh, with, um, with uh, the adequacy of their economic resources. Uh, el elderly LGBTQ people um, who are thinking about um, living in a, a setting for older people and going into elder housing often uh, face uh, concerns that they'll have to go back into the closet. Um, and this number is even higher for people who are transgender and non-gender uh, conforming um, uh, that's over half uh, are worried that they'll have to obscure their um, their their person um, to in order to get care and seek accommodation in elder housing. So uh, you know uh, unemployment, um, poverty, um, racism also mean that for people of color, um, and I shouldn't have left out transphobia. Um, that the challenges are even greater. Um, so these financial concerns are a big part of it, um, but um, they're not the only issue. Uh, there are also issues of what happens to you as a person when you can't express who you are. But I'm gonna take a minute to talk a bit more about the costs of, uh, of healthcare. And not only do you need to see a provider, you need to be able to follow their advice, um, fill your prescriptions when they're given to you, and nearly half report that they have to get creative uh, about um, uh, uh, procuring their medications or other healthcare costs. Uh, one in five respondents in this survey that I've been talking about reported delays in refilling medications or avoiding seeing, seeking a referral to a specialist because of costs. And others, you know, do split doses um, or just simply don't fill their prescriptions at all. This year, in recognition of Pride Month, the New York State Health Department released a report that highlighted the unique disparities facing LGBTQ uh, and queer communities. No, I, I'm sorry, I was supposed to read this all out for you. Uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities, uh, which account for about 8% of adults nationwide. And the report offers a foundation upon which to strengthen initiatives yeah. to reduce barriers to health care and boost the services that we need for care to the LGBTQ plus community. You know, often people think that we spend so much more time describing the problem than we do in addressing it. Uh, but I want to make the case for the importance of data, not only for those of us in in government who can use uh, data as a roadmap to building a more compassionate public health uh, 
that we can use to share with local county health departments, but also for the larger community, uh, for community-based organizations, advocates and advocate and activists who can use these data uh, to advocate for more services, which is an important role, um, not only waiting for government, but making the case to government uh, that we need to do better based on the data. So the report revealed some pretty alarming trends, particularly as they report re relate, related to older LGBTQ people. Uh, one was healthcare access limitations, having no healthcare provider, having no health insurance, and these are all more likely to occur in the LGBTQ community um, uh, than in the state's overall adult population. And then there's the issue, not only of physical health, but of mental health, which is obviously core to our overall well-being. And mental health issues are more likely to arise among people who are LGBTQ um, than in our, our overall adult um, population. And this is particularly true among the transgender population. Uh, I'll never forget a figure that I used to quote, and, I, and it's been a while, uh, so it may be not up to date, but the life expectancy of a black transgender woman was 39 years, uh, the, the lowest life expectancy that I've seen for any population group. Um, so among transgender adults, uh, the diagnosis of depressive disorder occurs in nearly 40%, uh, much higher than older lesbian, gay, and bisexual adults who, among whom it occurs in about 30%, and that's twice as high as, uh, as the 16% that we see in uh, New Yorkers as a whole. So these data help the health department set priorities for how to support the LGBTQ plus population. Uh, in New York State, in our 2023 budget, the budget year that we're currently in, about halfway through, uh, an additional $7 million in funding was specifically allocated to these needs. And this enabled the department to increase its efforts uh, the new investment will address urgent and emergent health challenges, including expanding provider capacity statewide and targeting underserved LGBTQ uh, populations in need of health care, including mental health. Uh, there's also, um, in addition to people with diagnoses of, uh, of mental health issues, such as depression and anxiety, the, a broader issue of social isolation, which affects everybody's uh, mental well being. We've all experienced that um, during the COVID years. But even before the COVID 19 pandemic, with its periods of quarantine and isolation, uh, LGBTQ people were, uh, all, uh, were already more likely to report feeling isolated. And this is especially true among gay men who are more likely to be single, less likely to have children or grandchildren. A recent survey done by AARP uh, showed that among older <clears throat> LGBTQ Americans, 38% of participants are married or in civil unions. So this is lower than, although in general, marriage is less common in the United States than in some other wealthy countries. But these, um, this is lower than the population as a whole. And among um, lesbian, transgender, and non-binary adults who are parents or grandparents, um, they are, um, uh, th these groups are more likely than gay men uh, to receive support from their, their family members. Uh, gay men, transgender, and non-binary adults are more likely to be single. Uh, and more than half of gay men, uh, transgender and non-binary adults report that they're living alone. And this obviously creates a set situation in which people can have a greater sense of isolation, especially as they age and find themselves with inadequate social supports. In comparison, 40% uh, of uh, lesbians said that they were living alone. 
So isolation and with it loneliness uh, can make people feel particularly vulnerable as they age. And this is certainly true also for LGBTQ people. They worry that they have no one to count on to check on them or to help them with tasks like picking up groceries or going out to get their medications. And this makes it um, especially difficult when uh, a person's sexual orientation has meant that they're estranged from their family because uh, all of us um, re rely on family ties. Um, but if you have unaccepting family members, this increases isolation. And a study done in California uh, showed that LGBTQ people were half as likely to have close relatives who they could call on for help. So this same study uh, identified that nearly a quarter uh, reported, uh, this was of older LGBTQ people, nearly a quarter said that they had no one to call in the event of uh, an emergency. And then of course came COVID and this multiplied those feelings of isolation for people who are living alone. I've worked in public health for 40 years. Gosh, saying that makes me realize how long it's been. And all of my years of work and in all of the many settings in which I've worked, um, I have really focused on the fact that unequal outcomes in health are unfair and preventable. And I've continued this focus here in Albany as I took on the position of being the state's um, uh, health commissioner. And you'll all know that I was able to convince Joanne Warren um, to take the lead as a deputy commissioner uh, of a new office here at the health department um, that's titled the Office of Health Equity and Human Rights. You all may know that the health department has a long going, long standing attachment to acronyms. Uh, so it's pronounced O'Hare, like the airport in Chicago. Uh, that's the Office of Health Equity and Human Rights. And this was part of um, a goal of elevating the issue of equity in the department's work. Um, I, I also wanna make it clear <clears throat> that this obligation belongs to the entire health department, uh, it, but the office will help ensure that we all meet that mandate uh, because uh, we need to reduce the impact of uh, discrimination and unfair treatment, uh, uh, the impact of stigma, uh, whether it's based on sexual orientation or on race or on drug use or on income levels. Um, we need to tackle this and it applies to every part of the health department and not just the programs, not just public health or hospitals or uh, our insurance programs. It also applies to how we spend our money uh, how we uh, recruit people to work here at the health department who with the organizations with which we contract and so on. Uh, so, you know, uh, I've already mentioned <clears throat> this frightening fact of uh, life expectancy among uh, uh, black transgender women. Um, and there's no doubt that uh, New Yorkers who are LGBTQ, who are Black, Latino, Asian American, are at the intersection of multiple levels of discrimination. Uh, they're discriminated against on the basis of race, which in our country often carries implications for income and on the basis of sexual orientation. So, uh, you know, um, this doesn't mean um, that when you struggled with a lifelong stigma based on sexual orientation, um, that you are protected from racism. Uh, people who face multiple forms of discrimination uh, don't get used to it. And the result is that, um, that we have significant consequences in terms of the health of all people of color. Uh, for black men, <clears throat> this translates into um, disproportionately high rates of heart disease, of diabetes and cancer, 
and a life expectancy that is four years younger. And in fact, COVID um, widened that gap further. Uh, so this is not because of bad luck uh, or bad choices or bad genes. It's because of the constraints that society places on our ability to procure a healthy life. And people of color too often uh, lack what access to what we have come to call the social determinants of health. <clears throat> I sometimes don't like that phrase because it almost becomes a, a, a checklist phrase uh, when we should think through what we mean by it. And what it means is your ability to have a job that pays a living wage, your ability to work a job where the working conditions are safe, your ability to get access to health care, which I've talked quite a bit about, your ability to buy healthy food. Does your neighborhood have a supermarket? Your ability to even have access to safe water, as we saw in the example of Flint, Michigan, um, and uh, decent housing conditions. Um, all of these are go into what determines our health. And uh, by way of um, linking it to today's conversation, um, the whole idea of home ownership, something that gives you, uh, uh, you know, a sense of security and stability in your housing, which is such a key part of a sense of security in life. Uh, we know that uh, that it's very much stratified by race, regardless of sexual orientation, uh, so that LGBTQ plus individuals who are Black or Latino are far less likely to be homeowners uh, than people who are classified as white. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, I often, when I read through uh, all of these challenges and the price that's paid for um, inequality in our society. I, I feel um, that um, that we leave out the, the the wonders and the contributions uh, that this community has brought to all of our lives. That we also need to acknowledge the this is a generation with grit, a generation that has survived the. Um, you know, the truly uh, lethal um, aspects of homophobia that we saw in the 40s, 50s, even into the 60s. I think it's less common now. It's a generation that survived the AIDS epidemic, got through COVID. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you should fight your battles alone. We want to support you at the state level. And we want to continue to make sure that you're aware of the legal protections that you have in place. We have the AIDS Institute, the New York State Office of Aging, uh, and we also have established a new office at the Health Department, along with O'Hare, the Office of Health Equity and Human Rights. We've established one called the Office of Aging and Long-Term Care. The AIDS Institute um, is uh, a a really venerated part of the state health department. It has a very long history of dedicating resources. It began with HIV prevention in 1994, uh, but it has expanded its um, portfolio uh, to look at all of the health and human services need of the LGBT community. And also, you know, not limiting it to HIV, but thinking about other health disparities and uh, working to ensure uh, communities awareness of the health and human service needs of, of this community across our state. The State Office of Aging uh, is committed to fostering inclusive programming and uh, it provides many opportunities for, um, for community organizations to obtain contracts to do important work, uh, including uh, work that addresses the unique service needs of the LGBTQ plus older adults. And I also um, mentioned this office um, of the OALTC, the Office of Aging and Long-Term Care. And, and this is uh, part of our growing acknowledgement of the graying of our 
population. Uh, in New York State, we have the fourth largest number of adults over the age of 60, and the proportion that is in that age group will continue to grow. Uh, so uh, we know that we need to uh, put new resources and new thinking into what it will mean to have a good health across the lifespan as we all age. And so this office will also address uh, the challenges of older LGBTQ uh, New Yorkers as they either age in place um, and an option that I think many people um, hope to achieve or enter long-term care facilities so that we can um, ensure that people don't face uh, re a renewed um, need to hide their hide them themselves. Uh, so I would like to return to the idea of invisibility as I conclude my remarks and say that we at the New York State Health Department, we see you, you're not invisible and you shouldn't make yourself so in order to access the care and services that are your right. I'm reminded by the words um, that have been sh were sh shared by an LGBTQ client at a health center in the Western part of the state. We survived the 80s AIDS scare. We helped push the marriage equality issue into law. So don't forget that we are still here and our voice is still relevant. So I couldn't agree more. This is a community that knows how to stand and fight and you have fought too long and too hard from the Stonewall uprising to the fight for medications to treat HIV AIDS to do not be denied now uh, your basic right to stigma free and compassionate care without hiding who you are. So with that, let me thank you for your attention and uh, conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Bassett for being here today, providing all of that valuable information and for taking your time out of your busy day for being part of the In My Mind conference. Um, would you be able to stay a few minutes to take questions? And if not, we totally understand. Uh, now, let me look, I, I, I would like to, if I, uh, I, I sort of go where people tell me to go. And, okay. Uh, hang on, I'm looking at my <laughs> schedule. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Okay, I fantastic. Yes. If there are any questions or comments, um, there was a question free. about the survey, and uh, the the one, uh, and I I will I will get that. Should I don't know, we'll get it. To I'll the send organizer. it to Antoine, and then we can okay. share it. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any questions for Dr. Bassett, please either raise your hand or enter it into the chat. Um, or if you have any comments, we'd be happy to read them. Sure. There are a lot of thank yous. People are just so grateful for your insight and for providing this information. I be I didn't say anything about monkeypox. I want to. Oh, I, that would be I great if you can say... give us just a brief update. I know that they sure. have changed the um, eligibility, so that's maybe right. we can talk about that. That would be yeah. I, I that's what I thought I might say something about. So first of all, I remember saying to a friend, you know, like tell all your friends um, that 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 you know this is not a great time to to go out to sex parties in New York City. Uh, this was in August. Um, but I, uh, and, and, and she said, well, I'm way past that kind of age. And so are all my friends. Uh, but we, we had, we did have older adults who, um, who, who were diagnosed with monkeypox. So this is, um, uh, but the good news is that we're seeing, uh, far fewer cases diagnosed, uh, although there have been cases diagnosed in, over half of the counties of the state, the vast majority of cases are in the greater New York City area, um, which means New York, where there have been about two thirds of all cases, and then um, the Long Island and Westchester um, being the, the next um, uh, places where we've seen most, most cases diagnosed. 
We recently got approval from our public health um, and health care advisory um, um, uh, council to um, uh, to call monkeypox an STD. Um, and the, the purpose of this was not to split hairs about how it's being transmitted, although the vast majority of people who've been infected with this virus um, were infected related to sexual activity. Uh, but uh, the reason that we did this was because we wanted adolescents to have the ability to go get tested, get vaccinated without having to come out to their parents. Um, and it's always uh, difficult for parents to come to terms with the fact that their teenagers uh, may be sexually active, and it may be even more difficult for them to accept that they uh, that they may be sexually uh, that their sons may be sexually active with other men. Um, but uh, we absolutely didn't want anyone have to have to be turned away, and unfortunately, that had happened. Uh, there were teens who showed up, um, and under until we got the uh, resolution yesterday. Uh, they they had to have parental consent in order to get uh, vaccinated. So we have changed that. Um, we have, um, uh, you know, continue. We now, anybody who feels like they should get vaccinated uh, can get vaccinated. We no longer have the criteria that we had earlier when we had such a limitation on vaccinations. So I don't know, uh, you know, if you know young people, we want them to know, uh, you know, that that they can go get vaccinated if they feel this would be a good idea for them. And um, and often word of mouth, you know, I don't know how we communicate with teenagers. Um, Social uh, media. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, social media. Media. And I think it's, that it's we great. have we have a lot of community um, partners um, and organizations at, on today's um, call. Right. And so I'm sure I, I just to say everyone, the, you know, anybody who and, and regardless of age who considers that they might be at risk um, and uh, should go get vaccinated. And uh, it's a to two dose vaccine. Um, it, we had been giving it mostly on the forearm, but you can request to have it elsewhere on your body, on your back, scapula, if you want. It scars. Yeah. Okay, I think there's a question. Um, what strategies would you recommend in the immediate and in, in the future? I ask as this climate has seen more support poured into communities, however, this could change with the new administration, how to sustain the, the strategies the that have government? been successful. I'm sorry? Do they mean the, the governor? I, I'm assuming that's what they're speaking oh, about. They're, okay. they're, they're writing from Chicago, so. Um, oh, I see. So they're probably talking about, uh, national. you know, the national the presidential yeah. elections, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, without, proclaiming any um, any political preference. I just would urge everybody to register and vote. Um, for, for, you know, for people of color, you know, we should always remember the high cost that there was to procuring this right, uh, which was really only attained in the mid 1960s. Um, so, you know, in honor to the many who fought for us, we should all be sure we use this but this is true for all of us and in our interest in maintaining a democracy. So, uh, you know, I, I just think that we, th these issues are the same regardless of the administration. And I don't know whether the person who wrote that in um, is, you know, was thinking about um, the, pre the former president Trump, but I don't know that he took terrible positions on LGBTQ issues. He, he, uh, but I think, you know, that, that, you know, these are, we're not single issue people, any of us. Um, so I'm not quite sure what particular issue you're thinking of, but I would urge people always to mobilize and fight for what they believe is right. 
Yeah, I mean, they also and referenced vote. in the chat the Older okay. American Act and CARES Act. Um, uh, not, yeah, not sure. Well, the CARES saying. Act was, I, I don't, I, I'd have to look at the Older American Act, but the CARES Act was unique. I mean, we haven't seen that kind of, um, kind of huge, massive federal investment in a long time. Um, I think uh, that we should remember it. It seems pretty unlikely that this level of investment will continue into the future. It uh, was really, in, in part, it was really related to the pandemic and, uh, and making it possible uh, for people to take, uh, take the actions that, they, that we needed as a society to reduce transmission of this novel virus. I hope it showed to everybody what government can do for us. Just waiting to see if there are any more questions. Sure. I don't know that much about the Older American Act. Maybe somebody could educate me. <laughs> okay, if you have any more questions or comments, please put it in the chat. While we still have Dr. Bassett with us. <laughs> Well, I, I don't need to drag things out here. Yeah. I really want to thank you no, no, no. for everybody. Somebody has his hand yes, up. Yes, I, I think Dr. Yes, yes, we did. Yep. Someone just put their hand Arvin up. got his hands up. But I also think that people may be digesting what you've been saying, and they're trying to, like, maybe, you know, there's a lot that you were talking about, just so that people kind of, like, really, uh, you know, identified with. And so they're probably digesting it. I, um, so, yeah. yes, over to Artie. Thank you, Antoine. Yes, um, I'm glad I was able to get the monkeypox in New York State. Initially, I started in New York City getting it, yeah. and I had such a hard time getting my second shot. I have to tell yeah. everybody because they wouldn't give me a second appointment with upon my 28th day, and they stretched it out. So I felt like we, me as a gay person, was hindered from having sex, even if I wanted to get the full two dose recommended completed. They wanted to stop us from having sex. I thought that was yeah. very bad from the current uh, city. Um, well, we didn't do that in the rest of the state, but I can yes. I can say um, so. And I I do appreciate that you know that people made their way up to Saratoga and other places to get second doses. Um, yes, um, I had to go to Westchester County to get my second dose. West, yeah, and I, I told but, all my friends that they had yeah. to go to Westchester because New York City wasn't helping us. Well, I think that they they were using the public health lens of the greatest good for the largest number of people. The real problem here was a shortage of the vaccine. And if I could just chat a little bit about that, this was a virus that we have known about for many years. It was first identified in the 1950s. It, um, and it was found in a human being in the 1970s. But um, it started increasing in frequency when we ended smallpox vaccination. The monkeypox virus is from the same family as the monkeypox, as the smallpox virus, although it's much milder. Uh, smallpox was a really scary disease, monkeypox much less so, but it occurred mainly in West and Central Africa in about 11 countries in that region. And it just was left there. Uh, nobody studied it. Uh, nobody talked about vaccination for it. And the U.S. reserves for the vaccine that we mobilized for monkeypox were uh, held for strategic reasons in case somebody got a hold of the smallpox virus and returned it to human population. So we were unprepared in part because we didn't care about this disease when it only happened in Africa. So the, uh, you know, which has, you know, so, you know, there just wasn't enough vaccine when we got started. And there still has been no vaccine sent to Africa, by the way, uh, uh, even though uh, ma major efforts were made to make it available to Europe and the US. So New York City took that decision because of the shortage of vaccine. 
and they wouldn't have taken it for any other reason. It wasn't an effort to, um, it wasn't an effort to, to um, you know, introduce a new treatment regimen. It was an effort to get some protection to the most people uh, because of the vaccine shortage. But um, I'm glad you got your your second dose from from out of New York City, uh, and I'm glad that you got vaccinated. Um, and uh, we have plenty of vaccine vaccine now, uh, and I really hope that people, um, you know, continue to seek vaccination if they think it's appropriate for them. Uh, we have what we've been calling a softening of demand, uh, so we have more vaccine right now than we have uh, people wanting to get it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Bassett, this is Antoine. It's here. my really pleasure. Glad. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Thank you. And get your booster for COVID. <laughs> While I'm at it, I should make that uh, clear um, that uh, that we have now a, a booster that is um, designed to address the most common virus, virus that's circulating now, as well as the original one, the bivalent back booster. And uh, we, we really need people. If you haven't got your last shot before July 1st, uh, you're eligible to go get another one if you're over 12, which I assume all of us are. So, um, all right. Thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank Have you a great for rest of your, your meeting. Have bye a bye. great, great afternoon. Thanks. Bye -bye. Well, that was amazing. That was great. Um, I know we all learned um, something from what Dr. Bassett had to share about um, health inequities, uh, monkeypox, as well as COVID within our communities.